Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 9, Episode 96. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for tuning in this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave Bryan, how you doing? I'm doing great. Is your is your bracket busted yet? <laughs> Dude, mine is terrible. I, I didn't get one pick right that wasn't like, you know, a 2 versus a 15 or a 1 versus a 16. St. Mary's was my Cinderella this year, knocked out by Nova, so I am... I'm hurting pretty bad. I had my heart a little bit too much invested in Nevada, of course. Uh, mm. uh, I thought, I mean, the Wolfpack had a great regular season and all, and I thought, uh, uh, plus, you know, I, I, I still have uh, animosity against uh, the state of Florida. I've always <laughs> I've always hated the Florida Gators, the Florida State, Alabama, Auburn. I know those aren't technically in the state of Florida, but uh, uh, where I'm from, it uh, all of it's considered <laughs> indeed in one kind of state there, if you will. Why do you hate uh, them? Uh, you hate just them? because it's just, it, 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 you know, that's SEC country down there. And, of course, Florida State, mm-hmm. uh, uh, not in the SEC. But uh, the rest, you know, Auburn, Alabama, and Florida, it's just all you, all you get there, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's over the top. Uh, uh, in your face, and I, I've all you know me being kind of uh, or growing up a, a Steelers fan, always been kind of connected more to Pitt and Penn State programs, and always kind of viewed them as my favorite college teams growing up and all, and just have absolutely hated uh, Florida, Florida State. Uh, Alabama and Auburn. Now, my my mentor who passed away, I think you know, six years ago, right around in there, he was a big Auburn su- uh, por- supporter, uh, a big fan of the football team and all. So I had a little leniency when it came uh, to uh, to Auburn and all. But uh, yeah, I was hoping for Nevada to to take it to Florida, and they were for it looked looked like for a little bit there, but they let it let it slip mm-hmm. away there. And I had them going to I think the eight there. Oh, wow. So yeah, that really that really put you back. All right, Dave. Well, speaking of um well, I don't the worst segue ever, but let's just jump into Steelers talk. I I thought I had a segue there. I didn't, but uh, the big news of the day just came in uh Friday morning, Morgan Burnett uh to be released be- on or before April's for April 1st, and that seems to be kind of a uh what a joke that signing was. So I guess the April 1st si- uh, release would be a, a good uh day to do it on, but Burnett officially gone, not a surprise. But uh, just a formality, it feels like some sort of accounting issue is, is delaying this release yeah, for some reason. Yeah, and I don't understand that unless, yeah. uh, uh, I, you know. Who forgot I, to I, carry the zero? <laughs> yeah, Omar forgot to <laughs> <laughs> Omar forgot to take his shoes off, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't understand the the reason, you know, why why that had to be put in there. I mean, just say that, just say that we just wanted to make sure we covered our back end, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, here. But uh, uh, obviously, when he wasn't cut before the start of the new league year, you know, you didn't, you didn't ever get a sense, at least I didn't, that, that he was going to be held on, on to, you know, past maybe the draft, but you did get a sense that maybe he would be held until the draft. But uh, I think now they have uh, uh, Mark Barron on board there. I think they feel a little bit more secure there. Uh, they don't need that cap, that extra cap space right now when it comes to him anyway. It'll be interesting to see if they do designate Morgan Burnett a post June first uh, release. Really, you know, the only save. You know, uh, 1.6 or whatever million more, 1.4, whatever the number is, more uh, in cap space by doing that. So, I mean, I, I can't really see the need to do it, but maybe they feel uh, they want that full five, five, a little over five million in cap space by designating them at June 1st uh, cap, cap, uh, or, or, or cap or salary cap release there. But the thing is, too, is is if you do designate them at June 1st release, as we explained to one of the readers uh, in or or listeners in an email the other day, you don't get that until June 1st. So it really makes no sense to do that. But I think the big news is is that they will be releasing him by April 1st. It would be appropriate to do it on April 1st, being as how it seems like kind of a full signing when you look, uh, a fool's signing when you look back at it over uh, a, a, a year ago there. Obviously, Morgan Burnett, 
uh, dealt with injuries last year, and by the time he got back in the lineup and all after that groin injury, uh, uh, rookie Terrell Edmonds, Edmonds was already playing a lot. Then Morgan Burnett became pretty much just a dime defender. He evidently didn't like that role. And several weeks ago, he even noted that you know he he wanted his uh, he wanted out of Pittsburgh after just one season because he didn't uh, care for the way he's used. I say good riddance uh, to him. Uh, time to move on, and now we'll just wait for the official release date. We will, and now it's all about exploring his replacement, and we know that Barron in, in some ways could, but the more that I learn about Mark Barron, the more I watch him, the more that I, I really feel this is a signing to address the Mac linebacker spot and less so on that dimebacker type role. So uh, I'll ask you the question, Dave. How would you replace Morgan Burnett? With Barron or you go and draft? And yeah. then if you go draft, who? Yeah, and, and, and as I kind of guesstimated the other day when we talked about Barron signing, I, I kind of viewed him more as a linebacker there. I you know, I think you can use him initially in some dime. I don't know how much, you know, I'm, I'm with you. The more that you dive into his tape, uh, and especially in, in, in the kind of the one-on-one situations where he's lined up in the slot or out wide, even though we didn't, or at least I haven't seen a lot of that last season, I don't think it's, it's something that you want to sign up for you know, uh, uh, on on a regular basis. There now is he is he better is is he a better cover option than say uh, uh, Bostic? Absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. Is he a better coverage option than L.J. Fort? I don't know about that. Uh, uh, but with that said, I think he gives you kind of at least a bridge uh, early in the season when it comes to maybe. Sp- Maybe playing some some you know playing more of that dime role, uh, but I still think it, at some point you're going to address that position, you know probably during a draft here uh, 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 with the player and one that hopefully that you can get on the field sooner rather than later uh, in, in that instance. So I'm not going to rule out Baron playing some early season dime. Heck, uh, they didn't even kind of go into more dime last year until when. Well, part because they didn't have Burnett really available the first week week or two of the year, but I think I think they did it pretty early. It, 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 the role expanded as the year went on. They used it as a, as a third and long package to just an every down package. Well, we but, we know how all that uh, played out. I mean, that, yeah, no, well. when Nat Burray, <laughs> what did he rough. play? Twenty snaps against the Ravens. Uh, yes. Tampa, I think it was Tampa. Or Tampa, and it, you know that was not something that we that we ever wanted to see again there. So, uh, but but look, uh, you know, uh, boss, uh, I'm getting my bees. You got some killer bees now on the other, <laughs> other side of, of the ball. I don't now. know about killer. <laughs> yeah, not killer. But uh, Mark Barron was asked during his introductory press conference of if he feels like he, you know, what what his role is going to be in in his. His assumption out of the shoot is that he's not going to come off the field, you know, especially when he's asked if he could be a three-down linebacker. Now, once again, you are paying him an average yearly value of six million. That doesn't mean too terribly much, but at least right out of the shoot. And then when you combine it with the fact that he's probably going to make seven million, you know, this season, he's going to be playing some snaps. So. How much, you know, we are we talking 500, 600, 800 snaps uh, in 2019? That's yet to be seen. But I think starting the season at least, he's going to be on the field quite a bit uh, with Vince Williams. And then, then we'll see how things go from there. Right. Like I said, that was kind of the, the plan B. If you can't get a Devin Bush, I think this team will attempt it. But it's certainly going to be difficult, and there's no guarantee of it. And if you can't, then, then Barron definitely becomes your, your starting Mac linebacker next to Vince Williams. Um, I, I, here's my thought with Barron on dime. Barron being on the roster doesn't stop you from drafting a dime guy one bit. Uh, you still go after one, and if you can't get one, you have a couple options with Barron. Again, it's not ideal, and you still have Marcus Allen on the roster. But I think you can and probably will get one, and you could look at names like Taylor Rapp from Washington, Monty Hooker from Iowa I'm a big fan of, uh, your guy, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson from Florida, Jonathan Abram from Mississippi State. I mean, you have options. Even if you wanted to go with a Nasir Adderley to be that kind of true free safety center fielder type, that's unlikely, but a name to throw out there as well. Um, so, yeah, the, the Baron signing – doesn't prevent you in the least from looking at a dime player. And and, and look, I mean, even with Burnett, <laughs> what is he, you know, at his age now, you know, uh, anything kind of compared to that isn't going to be bad. Right. 
And then the, the the options this team has cycled through for the last three, four years are Robert Golden and William Gay and Burnett and Burhey and Marcus Allen for a game. Um, it's hard to be worse. You just want to see some more versatility and more options in there. And I'm with you for sure uh, uh, that, that when you look at a guy like uh, 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 Mark Barron and then you look forward to the draft they're going to it'll be a surprise if they don't draft a dime light player yeah i think that they will i think you have options the need and the flexibility based on the free agency moves that you've made all right uh where to now well i guess kind of sticking with the draft we can recap some of the pro days and dave you can probably talk about yesterday a little bit better than i can uh she was right west virginia had uh, colbert tomlin and jerry Olsofsky for a couple receivers and a linebacker and also buddy matt sim spotted i think six in total we're trying to figure out who the other let's see we 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 named four there i think there's six personnel from the steelers in total there don't quite aren't sure who the other two are there but uh obviously with kevin colbert and mike tomlin being there you know they chose that you know they they chose that place for a reason they're all uh, what else was going on yesterday as far as uh bigger name schools do you remember uh some of the other places i saw the steelers at missouri south carolina then some smaller ones like tulane and western michigan uh usc i went to usc after yeah, it was a couple of days ago, but yeah, South Carolina is probably the other big one yesterday. And I think uh, the the uh, the uh, South Carolina stuck out to me a little bit. Of course, where uh, Dabo uh, was uh, was working out there, I you know, look, I I hate to put uh, definitives on on things, but when it comes to playing Blues Clues with the Steelers in the draft and Mike Tomlin and Kevin Colbert, them not showing up at the Georgia Pro Day. Them not showing up at the uh, South Carolina Pro Day. I think you could go ahead and rule out uh, uh, DeAndre Baker as being the team's number one draft pick. And I think you can uh, uh, rule out uh, Dabo, the wide receiver, uh, there with, uh, with, with South Carolina as being a first-round selection. Yeah, and I thought the odds of, of Debo Samuel being a first round pick was probably low. I think though at fifty two, if what, he's what, there. What I call him, Dabo. I, Dabo. I, keep, I, I, <laughs> I think I you got keep, like Dabo Sweeney I, and Debo Samuel. Yeah, I, I keep getting the the the, uh, the two uh, mixed up. There. I keep calling him Dabo for for some reason. You got the B's and the the D's to work on today. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think at fifty two, which I mean, would you consider Debo Samuel at, at fifty two overall? Because I sure as heck would. Oh yeah, absolutely. I I think he's yeah. in play uh, uh, there uh, for sure. But uh, uh, as far you know, we we had kind of I think both kind of toyed with the idea of, of of him maybe in the first. But I think yeah. that's out. I think I, yeah. I I really think Baker's out as well too. And I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure Baker's a first round corner. I mean in this class maybe. But remember. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at, you hate to judge these guys just by their 40 times, but uh, right after the combine there, I posted, you know, corners that have gone in the first round dating back to, I forget how, how far I went back there. It's rare to see one with a 40 time as high as what Baker had at the combine uh, being being drafted uh, in, in the first round there. So uh, I, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you this, I won't have uh Debo or Baker uh, in my mocks in the first round moving forward yeah I probably won't either I like DeAndre Baker um we know that Keith Butler was there but as we've talked about for a Steelers first round pick to basically qualify you gotta have Tomlin or Kevin Colbert to be there so just to recap where those guys have been because those are the big names you want to yeah, know yeah about. run it down because I I'm, I'm running out of push pins here <laughs> uh I'm just doing it on the fly here but Colbert's been at Clemson Michigan Bama Notre Dame in West Virginia, and Tomlin has been at, let me pull up the list here, Clemson, Michigan, and West Virginia. So those, so those are the schools. WVU, Bama, what, Notre Dame, Michigan, Clemson, I think, um, those are the ones I said. All right. Now, does it concern you at all that we could not find Tomlin for two days in a row? Yeah, I don't know where he was at. Um no, I don't know if it concerns me. I don't know if he was doing something at the facility or something with his kid. You know, his kid's going to Maryland this year. I don't know if there's something there they were taking care of, but uh, I, I don't have a reaction to it. Yeah, I just uh, I found it curious that and, and look, I mean, he's easy to identify. So if he would have yeah. shown up at any of these pro days, 
you know, especially along with with uh, with Colbert, I'm sure it would have been reported. But I uh, found mm-hmm. it found it interesting that we couldn't locate him. And also, look, I mean, for the first time in forever, they weren't at the Ohio State Pro Day. At least uh, Colbert wasn't. Yeah, they sent, uh, as far as we know, Adrian Clem, the assistant offensive line coach, Matt Sims, who's an offensive assistant, works mostly with the quarterbacks, and Dan Colbert, Kevin's son. But uh, they were, because that was because Bama, uh, Colbert was at Alabama, I think that day. Or no, he was at uh, Notre Dame, excuse me. So that's where we know uh, he was at that day. And also, Kevin Colbert might have been at Michigan State. Not, couldn't confirm that, but also something to keep in mind. Yeah, uh, Justin Lane would be a guy to watch there. And who's who's another one at, at, at Michigan State? Uh, probably LJ Scott, the running back, would be a day three candidate. All right. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Were you surprised? Uh, we had. Did we talk about them having Miles? Uh, what's his last name? Boykin. Boykin uh, scheduled for a pre-draft visit. No, we haven't yet. We know of two confirmed, I mean, not by the team, but by media reports, pre-draft visits of the possible 30. Uh, Miles Boykin, the receiver from Notre Dame, who lit up the combine, and there's questions about does the tape match the combine, um, but he performed really well there. And then Mike Weber from Ohio State was, I think he said that after his Ohio State Pro Day that he's coming in for a visit as well, and you're looking at him as a probable day three running back. Now, are you surprised that they showed up at the uh, at, at, at the uh Colbert showing up at the Notre Dame Pro Day like that. Well, they they brought a lot of people. I mean, they brought Kevin Colbert. They had Terrell Austin. Austin's been working the circuit pretty hard this year. Phil Kreidler, the college scouting coordinator. Dan Rooney Jr. was there. Uh, But there's a lot of talent at Notre Dame. You know, Julian Love, I think, is a day two corner. Um, Solo second round. Boykin, I mean, seeing the the pre-draft visit, no surprise there. They got some linebackers to work with. True Tranquils, a a former safety turn linebacker. And you mentioned Jerry Tillery is a guy you don't want to forget about either, potentially on day two. Right. I want to, I look forward to diving a little bit deeper, maybe even today into some of the Tillery tape. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and, uh, the good thing about it is, is there's a lot, you can almost find all the games for the last three years or so of Notre Dame on on the YouTube machine. So uh, I think I'm going to try to do a contextual, a full contextualization of him uh, today or, or through the weekend for sure, because look, he fits. He definitely fits what the Steelers like to you know look for as far as uh, uh, the defensive end slash defensive tackles go. So I'm interested. I've, I think I've only seen really a game and a half on him. Now, I did get into the Miles Boykin take quite a bit. How much did, did you know about Miles Boykin uh, uh, ahead of the announcement that he's coming in for a uh, pre-draft visit? And uh, you know, where, where are you at on him? Well, he's on my list to watch. I think he's actually the next guy I'm going to watch. I just haven't gotten around to it with all the free agency stuff. But certainly the height, weight, speed guy. And we know the Steelers love their height, weight, speed. I mean, he's what, six? How tall is he? Six, two, two, 200 something. He ran four, four, two, jumped 43 and a half inches in the vertical, like what, 10, seven in the broad. I mean, just that, that paper athlete. But again, the question that, that I've heard and, and, you know, from seen on Twitter and stuff like that is just he doesn't play that fast or doesn't play that athletic on tape. And now you have to go back and try to match things up. Right, and I have contextualized all of his 2000, all but one of his uh, 2008 targets. And uh, impressive kid. Now, he has some minor drop issues, uh, and his P, P Spark score uh, is off the charts. I mean, mm-hmm. it's 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 unreal uh, uh, what he registered at the combine. Of course, he was the one that had uh, the the uh, the the uh, video that went viral during the combine after he ran that 40 yard dash of all the play Notre Dame players jumping around in in the locker room, knowing that he just you know made some big time mm-hmm. money there. But he is an, an impressive specimen. At what is he almost six four two twenty for him to post mm-hmm. uh, post what he did uh but you're right he does he doesn't he glides more than he's he jumps off tape as far as speed goes he can get separation though uh you will see separation on his tape now now mind you i only looked at his targets and his targets only and you know he can make some combative catches in there he seems to to do a good job overall with with plucking the football out of his hand i mean out, out of the air with his hands in other words not so much a body catcher i don't think you see a lot of double catching uh going on with him uh seems to be an okay route runner he's very look he's very raw still 
Uh, mm-hmm. He he kind of came out of nowhere last year. A couple of decent uh, or, or a couple of, of very subpar, I think sub-20 catch seasons at Notre Dame and then just flew onto the radar with what do you have, 50 or 60 catches or something uh, uh, last season there. And, of course, I think eight touchdowns. Uh, is he's, he's not a guy. He can play the X. He mostly played the X receiver spot at Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is a guy that if you did draft him in, let's say, the, I don't know, sec, late second, third, fourth round, wherever he's going to go at, you're not going to rush to get him on the field. But. He is a guy that maybe by midway through his, his rookie season, you can integrate more and more into uh, in, in, into your offense, and especially when it comes to red zone uh, because of that size and occasionally in three, three, four wide receiver sets because of the way he's able to stretch stretch the field for you in such a big body as well, too. So I was glad that he came out and he said that he's got a pre-draft visit uh, scheduled because, A, he matches what the Steelers look for and need right now, and, B, it forced me to jump into his tape right away. And and overall, uh, I find his tape impressive. Yeah, again, kind of fits what the Steelers look for, and that's why you sign a guy like Dante Moncrief. So if you draft a receiver that's a little bit raw, and we know that's a position that's tough to transition to for any player, you know, Juju is the exception to the rule, um, that gives you the flexibility and the options that you need as an offense. Uh, real quick note on Tillery, because I know you're going to watch him. I know he played hurt basically all year. He's got that, I think, a torn labrum he just got surgery on. So he's kind of to it like in that regard where he's a talented player but has played hurt and couldn't really work out in the pre-draft process because of the injury. So maybe that kind of dings his value by a round or two and could be an opportunity for Pittsburgh to, to get good value in maybe round three if he falls. And we know the Steelers have no issue drafting players that they like who may have not been through, done hardly anything through the pre-draft process. Uh, right. Heath, Heath Miller, uh, obviously the first example that comes to mind uh, him w- him. Uh, with him. And then Stefan Tuitt a few years ago, as you mentioned. Uh, Cam had, Hayward with an uh, elbow. Yeah, Cam, yeah Cam Hayward uh, had some surgery. Uh, that I think that it, that it kept them out of the Senior Bowl and then beyond uh, after that as well too. So the Steelers trust their scouting part. Don't need don't need the Underwear Olympics to uh, you know uh, gold medals in the under, un, Underwear Olympics are not needed you know for for yep. them. So I think Tillery is a guy you have to pay attention to. Uh, uh, look like you mentioned they they have a lot of talent there at Notre Dame. Love is somebody that I look forward to getting into. And context, fully contextualizing his uh, his defensive plays there at Notre Dame. So I, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, and I think I think we could see a guy drafted by the Steelers out of Notre Dame this year, if not maybe <laughs> two of them. Mm-hmm. Yep, get your Fighting Irish in your mocks, get your Michigan Wolverines in the mocks. I think there's good talent in both schools, heavy interest shown in both schools, and probably going to see somebody, multiple guys potentially from those places. Another guy, Dave, that you wanted to talk about, kind of circling back to what, what happened yesterday with West Virginia, was inside linebacker David Long, because I get a question all the time, you know, this team can't get Devin Bush or Devin White, what do they do? And we know that Mark Barron has helped kind of create that insurance policy and that backup option, but you're also still trying to find maybe an inside linebacker in the mid-rounds, or at least, you know, day two and beyond, um, to give you depth and replace guys like L.J. Fortin to, to be in the mix, and I think David Long would be a candidate to, to be in that mix. You would be correct, sir, and, hey. and you know, I, I think you know, we, we just said, get a, get a fighting Irish in your mock drafts, uh, get maybe a Michigan Wolverine potentially in, in, in your mock drafts, you're probably going to want to think about getting a West Virginia player in your mock draft as well, too, if not uh, one of the wide receivers in, in, in Jennings or uh, what's his last name? Seals. Yep, David uh, Seals the fifth. Uh, the fifth, <laughs> not to be confused <laughs> with the first four. Nope. Uh, look, look, I, I did a contextualization after the Senior Bowl of Seals and the explosive plays uh, that he had. I think one of the drawbacks on him is okay. How is how is Seals when you put somebody on him? You know, mm-hmm. when when you bodied him around, I only looked at his big plays and his big plays only. I had to go back and look at 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 how he played, maybe against some press coverage at all. Uh, Jennings is another impressive guy. Uh, I I think that would meet what the Steelers need. And boy, when you look at uh, I don't how much did you know or how much have you watched of David Long Jr. Not, not to be not to be confused with the David Long from Michigan, by the way, right, which right. evidently the NFL.com is having a problem with. 
Well, hey, you might want to get both David Longs in your Steelers mock drafts because I think both are potential. Uh, that'd be how they're going to work the jerseys out for that one if both become Steelers. Uh, no, I, I look at your contextualization post. Um, I got to go through a lot of these inside linebackers. I know that we had a lot of the other guys that do draft profiles that focus on the off-ball guys. I started with cornerbacks, so I want to circle back. But but a guy that, that that's kind of gotten some quiet intrigue, I guess, maybe if that's the right phrase for it, you know, kind of a, a contradiction there. But an athlete that you could look at, you know, is a day two, day three guy with him and, and guys like Terrell Hanks and Blank Cashman. Why Why do you – now, I, I tell you, how many snaps have you watched along, do you think? Uh, I haven't sat down and watched them. I saw your contextualization post, and that's really the, the bulk of my work. Have you watched – Yeah. How, how many other plays of the contextualization have you, have you seen? A few – does it? Uh, yeah, I, I cycled through some of the big ones, like half of them. Okay. Why do you think maybe he's not being talked more about a potentially being, I don't know, the third, fourth, fifth off the ball linebacker in this year's class? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I'd have to look at his career arc. Did he did he start late? I don't know if that's something. Just just you know, just didn't isn't playing at the most power five school when you have guys like Mac Wilson there. And and I don't think really. I think you go through that top three guys: uh, Devin White, Devin Bush, and and, and Mac Wilson. And then it's kind of kind of take your pick. I don't know if anyone's getting talked about really as that fourth or fifth off ball linebacker. It's all kind of a jumbled mess where you got to find your your flavor. I after going through this tape on him and doing a a how many contextualization plays did I have doing him fifty eight uh, over the course dating back to two thousand sixteen and reading up a little bit on his on his back history he is one of I think twelve kids his dad was a former. A uh, heavyweight boxer as wow. well in the Cincinnati area. So this kid is this kid's got got some backbone to him. Now he is uh, what what do you measure in at five five eleven three yeah, five, think, five eleven three or something like that. Yeah, I think the size is the, the answer to the question of why he's getting talked about more. All right. Well, we're talking about Devin Bush, and you know he's he's under six foot as well too. Mm-hmm. Uh, now he, here's the thing with uh, with David Long and and listeners, I, I've been getting a lot of this the last few days, so I just want to kind of set the record straight for you because I just got this, the record straight set straight for me after his pro day. Uh, talking about David Long on 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 Thursday, there <clears throat> he only lifted. At the combine, okay, and I think he did. What what they show there? 18 reps. Am I remembering that correct? Correctly, Alex. I think 18 reps for long at the combine. He did not do anything at the combine because he apparently had suffered an ankle sprain at the Senior Bowl. All right. Now fast forward to yesterday's pro day. All he did was tape that ankle up and did some did some linebacker drills. He still decided not to do uh, any of the other events. So he's probably going to be another one of those players that goes into the draft here with with not having any, any underwear Olympics uh, stuff other than the uh, uh, the uh, the bench press done there. And once again, I uh, and I watched his entire post pro day interview with the media, he said that he did not do any of the other stuff because of the ankle sprain that he suffered at the senior ball there. Now, this kid is still incredibly young. He played a lot of games uh, uh, at, at, at LA, I mean, at uh, West Virginia there, uh, just uh, once, once arriving on campus there, he really earned his, earned his badge there. So you got a, a young kid who I think had to, he's technically an underclassman, but he's one of these ones that why, I, I still haven't figured it out. He was, he had to declare, but he got mm-hmm. some sort of special stipulation. Anyway, he still went to the senior bowl on top of it, even though he was an underclassman. I forget, and there's been like two or three players like that. So he's still incredibly young as far as I can tell. He, he had a, a nice... Uh, uh, amount. I think he played 34 games that he played in at West Virginia, dating back to 2016. 40 tackles that resulted in lost yardage. Alex, uh, <laughs> 40. Uh, mm-hmm. He also registered 10 total pass breakups to go along with a forced fumble. He had seven hurries and 14 total sacks. All right. Now I still have to look how he is. 
you know, as far as dropping in coverage, when you when you're going through a, when you're building a contextualization of plays that that the kid made, you're looking for pass breakups. You're looking for, and most of his pass breakups were kind of things that he had rushing the quarterback and 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 kind of batting a ball down or getting a hand on the ball closer to the line of scrimmage than it was out in coverage being a pass defense so I just want to clarify that so I want to go back now and thank God we've got plenty of time to do it go back and look at how he is actually in coverage running with you know tight ends and running backs and, and those kind of things but I've I got to admit to you when you look at it from a from a, uh, a big defensive play contextualization standpoint when you look at his athleticism, when you look at his 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 uh, uh, defensive awareness and all like that, that section of tape looks better than than Bush's. I'm I'm just wow. putting it out there. I, I I'm not I'm not I'm not you know defend you know putting a definitive on any of this. I'm just telling you that from what I've watched of uh, Bush's you know uh, key plays contextualization. Versus what I just watched yesterday on David Long, and plus I, I probably watched in total now uh, 250 snaps of Long. I think he looks better on tape than Bush does. I, I'm just putting it out there. Hey, I like it. I like the boldness. Uh, where do you see him going? Do you see him as a guy at 52, at 66, at beyond later? I mean, where would you peg him? I'm uh, look. I, right now, I'm going to say day two, Alex. And, and well, where on day two, like round two, or do you think? You I know, I, mean, I think it's open. I, I mean, look. Yeah. I mean, we know how you know teams' needs and all play into that. But uh, okay, let let me put it to you this way. Uh, uh, round three runs through what pick? Uh, well, with, what they uh, have on day two, hey, they have what fifty two, sixty six, and eighty three, don't they? I think I think those are their picks on day two. I think he's a top. I think he goes in the top 100. How's that? Well, what what pick makes the most sense for him? 52, 66, or 83? If you had well, to pick one for the Steelers, yes, yes. No, come on. <laughs> I'm not, I'm I not know. I, I look. I, I think he is a guy that could potentially be in play for them in, as high as the second round. Now. Okay. What would, would how surprising? Look, the Steelers reach, right? I mean, they're not afraid to go around or or, or, or you know half around or around early on a guy that they like. I think they like him. All yeah, right? well, I mean, they so, were they sent they sent some big decision makers to watch him yesterday. So now, sure. Now here's the thing: we don't have we don't have the data on him. We're we're, we're probably not going to have the data on him to to look at his measurables. All right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and play the stats. You know, play play the stats game uh, uh, with him. But look, I, I'll, I'll tell you this. Here's what I want everybody listening to the podcast uh, to today to do for me. All right, and and that includes you, Alex. Weekend homework right. while you're watching March Madness. Here, go go through his 50 plays, 50 whatever plays that I have contextualized on the site. And, and tell me and, and send me feedback uh, as unbiased as, as all of you. Can, and I know we have a lot of uh, Devin Bush fans listening to the podcast out there. OK, as unbiased as you can run through those 58 plays of, of, of David Long and tell me your honest assessment of him compared to maybe what you know or don't know of Devin Bush. That's that's all I'm saying. Get, give me an honest comparison of him. I'm not trying to hype the kid too much. I'm just telling you that his his big play uh, tape looks better than Bush's. That's where I'm at with him in this process, and that's where I'm at with him as far as where he could be drafted. Now, uh, regardless of, of, of getting through the rest of his tape, at worst, I see him as a fourth-round guy. Yeah. I, I think you probably will go day two from everything that you said, everything that I've kind of read. I, I do wonder if they have some sort of times on him because obviously he didn't work out at, uh, at the combine or his pro day. But there are junior pro days. You know, when the seniors start to work out each year, they will usually go through stuff and time stuff. And that gets sent off to scouts to kind of help build that up. And oftentimes the juniors, the underclassmen will also work out. You know, we know that Rashawn Evans worked out. Uh, the year uh, before he got drafted, and he didn't work out in the pre-draft process, but you had some numbers on him. So I'm curious. I know the long is an underclassman, but I wonder if his the start of the 18, if he 
had gone through some stuff and, and if there's any sort of data on him. Um, I'd be curious to know if, if they have that information. Yeah, and and I don't I don't right now have that. It'd be interesting. Yeah. It'd be, sure I mean, it ser- wouldn't be public. It would not be public information. Generally. Well, I mean, it might be something floating around out him as far as a forty yard dash time goes. You know, yeah. as far as is is maybe as uh, uh, you know his high school or whatever. You know, uh, well, high school. I don't know about high school, but like Rashawn Evans at his junior pro day ran a four six three, and he didn't. You know, that was a forty time that we had on him, and that wasn't made public, but. Uh, you know, that's something that you can go off of if you're a scout or a team, even though he didn't work out at the combine or at his party. He never ran a 40 in that pre draft process, but you go off his other, his, his previous workout just to give you a gauge of where he's at. So, what, 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 what would you, what would you expect someone, I mean, in a four or five range is what you would expect at least, right? Yeah, I would hope so. Now those, you know, the times aren't always deal breakers for inside linebackers. I mean, you know, Mac Wilson running a four, six, five or whatever he ran or whatever i forget what time he had i mean it's not the worst thing but yeah if, if long could crack into the the high four or fives that'd be fantastic all right i obviously don't have time to search that out right now but i'll try to look look uh, at that but for the rest of you listening uh, put your bias aside and go watch the contextualization on him and send me an email the terrible podcast at gmail.com i just think he's an uh you know if you when you look at you know, all of our talk so far is, man, they got to get either either one of those Devons, all mm-hmm. right? But what if they don't? And what if they right. don't trade up? And, what you know, what if both those, those kids are gone way before the Steelers pick and they can't trade up and all like that? They still have got to try to address the inside linebacker position in this draft. Uh, regardless of, of Mark Barron and all. So I think he is a guy that more Steeler fans need to uh, need to get themselves acquainted to acquainted with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just to throw out two other names here real quick um, that I've looked at and, and read about again, Terrell Hanks from Mexico state. Now, unfortunately they get no 40 time on him because he pulled a hammy at the combine running his first 40. So he came in with like a four nine nine. It's not an accurate number. It's obviously affected and hindered by the injury. But um, again, an athlete, instinctual guy, guy that made a ton of plays in New Mexico State. I mean, the, the heavy production, I think, helps make you feel more comfortable about him coming from a, a smaller, non-Power 5 school. And then Blake Cashman from Minnesota, a guy that's gotten a lot of love since the Combine, who ran really well in the four fives. And had it not been for Devin Bush and Devin White having absurdly good workouts, you'd hear even a lot more about Blake Cashman. And that's, again, a Power, power 5 guy. So as him, as a day two pick, probably – and that 66 or 83 kind of range um, would be another name to mention. So I think if you don't get Bush, you don't get White, you're looking at David Long, Terrell Hanks potentially, Blake Cashman as kind of being the guys, and of course you're throwing those, those dime players as well. I think Cashman's a little bit older, is he not? Man, I tell you, there's so much you don't know what the age is of, mm-hmm. of some of these kids floating around. Yeah. I've now seen uh, DeAndre Baker listed a little bit. Uh, younger than than what some of the original reports are, so it'd be, it'd be nice. Not that it's that it's a prerequisite, but it sure would be nice to know the true age on some of these guys. I think, unfortunately, we're gonna have to wait. I know uh, uh, who's the guy uh, formerly of NFL Draft Scout now with the land, uh, 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 Dane Brugler. When his mm-hmm. draft guide comes out, which will probably be pretty soon, I think he does a good job of having to correct date of births on, in there. But unfortunately, during this pre, this early pre-draft process here, we kind of struggle getting correct age, ages on 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 some of these draft hopefuls here i tell you what my some of my homework's going to be over the weekend uh alex when it comes to long is is uh look try to find more of him in coverage and what he's done there and and you know and and try to form a little bit better opinion on 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 him but you know i i'd be interested to hear what some of our listeners who are big bush fans you know, what they would think on, on, on what they've seen on long so far. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a good starting point. And I'm going to, I'm going to come after you on the uh, Tuesday podcast to get more of an opinion on long. So be ready. I will wear my hard hat. Uh, The internet tells me Cashman is going to turn 23 in May and I don't have an age on David long. So one place said 22, but I don't have a birthday or anything like that. See, I've seen 20 on long. (laughs) <laughs> oh, he's not. He's a June. He's not twenty. He's a redshirt junior. Uh, I'm just. I'm just telling you. I've. I've seen he's it. At, I've college seen at it, sixteen. I'm, I'm just. Kids. I'm just telling you. I've seen. I've seen it that low. That's how. That's how off some of these things are. Yeah, that's one of those like. 
basketball players that's in high school. It's like 30, <laughs> something like that. He, he's not 20. He's probably 22, 23. All right, Dave, before we get into uh, Mike Hilton, some news there with Mike Hilton. Let's talk about our friends. Since it is March Madness and the tournament started and my bracket's busted already, let's talk about our friends over at MyBookie. All right, Alex, the first weekend of the NCAA tournament is the greatest betting event of the year. And we're now in, I think, the second day of it here. Whether you like filling out a bracket, picking a national champion, predicted first round upsets, or <clears throat> or all of the above, mybookie.ag is the perfect home for your March Madness fun. Well, Zion Way, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> can't let, me, let, me let me ask you real quick, Dave, before you clear your throat. Who, who are you picking for your champion or your final four? Because for me, I have UNC over Duke. I know everyone's going to go Duke, so I feel like I had to go in a different direction, but I'd love to see that rematch for what, the fourth time, I guess it would be. Uh, of UNC Duke in a, in a title game. Yeah, I, I look. I, I'm not a big Duke fan, but I picked Duke. Okay. Fair. Well, it's hard, hard not to with Zion Williamson. Right. Uh, uh, all the above. MyBookie.ag is a perfect home for your March Madness fun. Will Zion Williamson and his teammates cement their legacy at Duke this year with a title? Can Virginia get past its loss to 16 seed last year? And Kentucky get back to the Final Four? If you know the answers, or even if you don't, MyBookie.ag is the place to get in on the action. They have something for everyone, even you, multiple bracket guy. Uh, MyBookie has been in business for years. Their goal is to give you the best customers customer service in the business and the best part is they pay out fast when you win i'm talking 48 hours fast bet with the best then kick back and enjoy march madness while you watch your picks cash in deposit with my bookie today with promo code terrible that means go to mybookie.ag and use promo code terrible for a 50 percent sign up bonus that's promo code terrible when my bookie you play you win and you get paid what you got on Mike Gilton? Mike Mill Mike Gilton wants to get paid a little something, <laughs> doesn't he? He does, yeah. Uh, he's not. He has not, and according to at least ESPN's Jeremy Fowler, doesn't plan to sign his exclusive rights tender. Uh, instead, he wants to try to work out a long-term deal with the team, similar to what happened to Alejandro Villanueva a couple of years ago. So. I, I assume this is coming from Hilton's side, not, not the Steelers' side, so he's going to have to see if the Steelers are as interested in, in him getting paid as he is, but what, what's your take there? Yeah, I, look, I see no issue with this as long as he follows the same path as Alejandro Villanueva did. That means mm -hmm. sh show up to all the OTAs, uh, show up. You know, show up, you know, just do everything that you're supposed to do during the off season. Don't hold out as an exclusive rights free agent. You don't, they, I don't know why they call right, have, have rights yeah. in there because they don't have much, um, uh, much of any rights whatsoever. You know, he, 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 if he does not sign that exclusive rights free agent tender, he cannot play period. Uh, mm -hmm. he, you know, as an exclusive rights free agent, he cannot uh, except any off-season offer sheets from from any other team there, so he's kind of a sitting duck here right now. So his only kind of form of our negotiation tactic whatsoever would be to not sign his tender just yet, do everything that he's supposed to do, just how Alejandro Villanueva did, and he would be smart to 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 follow that playbook to the T and not talk too much about it when asked about it either. You know, let this mm -hmm. stuff let this stuff carry out it the way behind closed doors uh, that it should, and and just go from there. And if he does that. There's probably a good chance, a chance that he that he's rewarded with a uh, some sort of an extension right right when when uh, when training camp opens. Now, if he if he wants to play hardball and not show up for OTAs, which is is, is his right as a of that, of that being voluntary for him to bypass that, but. Uh, I would not suggest it because if he does, <laughs> that's not going to look good. I, I don't think on his uh, part. I, to me, I don't think I don't see why you would use it as a negotiation tactic, uh, 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 in, in, especially in his case right here. Do what you're supposed to do. Go to all. You'll know, go to the OTAs. Uh, go to the mandatory mini camp. Show up uh, for training camp and hope. Uh, the Steelers reward you maybe with some sort of a three-year deal or something along those lines. Now, his earnings his earnings are potentially capped here, you know, because, mm -hmm. look, he is a exclusive rights free agent this year. If he does not get a new deal and he has a he'll be an exclusive, he'll be a restricted free agent next year with at most a second round tender on him. 
And then, you know, uh, would would the Steelers think about franchise tagging him? Probably not. No. But even if you even if he did, you know, a couple of years from now, that's kind of what his max earnings are. So the Steelers are set to get him at a bargain basement price here for. You know, and lock him up for another couple of years and do him right on top of it. So I understand why he's doing it. I just would hope that he follows the Alejandro Villanueva playbook when it comes to the off season here. And that does appear to be the plan. There's no indication he he plans on skipping any sort of time. But you're right. There is certainly an irony to the the phrase "exclusive right free agent." When about three of those words don't apply to him, like only exclusive. There's no right. There's no free agency to it. But I, my question is just. You know, how does the team view Mike Hilton? Because he's played well, but we know at the the back half of last year, he, he lost some playing time. He did struggle some. You know, Cam Sutton started to play more. His team stopped running nickel. And, of course, he was still out there in dime packages. But, you know, they, they, they kind of phased him out. So have they soured on Mike Hilton? Do they see a long-term future with him? Would they want to commit any sort of money to him? Or would they rather ride out for real cheap this year and still pretty cheap for next year? So that's my question with Pittsburgh is that how do they value Mike Hilton. I like Mike Hilton. I've talked about Mike Hilton since basically started training camp two years ago. But how do they see him? Do they see him as a long term guy? And I think that's an open ended question right now. Yeah, and look, it's a lot different situation than Villanueva being a starting right. left tackle. <laughs> right. And, and to be fair, Hilton deserves to get paid. He's, he's worth way more than six hundred and forty five thousand this year. He's still right now, as far as I know, the starting nickel corner. But do they see him that as the rest of this year or next year? I don't quite know. Yeah, and look, his value right now to the team, if you pay a guy like Steven Nelson the amount of money that you're paying him and expect him to do what he's what he's doing, I, I, I view, and, and you make a good point of how Hilton wasn't used towards the end of last season, you know, he's a 3 to $4 million guy probably at most right now. So... Mm-hmm. You know, can you lock him up with a three-year deal? Does he give you enough special teams value? Is he a good enough kind of backup player that you're comfortable with keeping him around at least the next two years? I think possibly yes, but you're not going to break break the bank for him uh, sure. on, on top of it. So once again, when you look at what uh, – I think you have to measure him at what his what – his, what the second round tender price would be on him next off season and yeah. may maybe very slightly more than that. That's his max ceiling worth at this time uh, with him. If he's wanting more than that, you tell him, <laughs> you know, don't hate, you know, don't hate the player, hate the game. Right. Yeah, it's a tricky spot. I mean, this team ran literally three snaps of their two, four, five nickel the last three weeks of last year. And again, there was a lot of dime. There was still Hilton getting snapped. That snap count was reduced. And this team wants to play this three, three, five with the the, the fifth guy being a safety instead of a, a nickel corner. And that's going to hurt his play time and his value more. So, you know, just the question is in the Steelers three to five year plan, does Hilton fit in there or they, would they be willing or you know, have a desire to, to, to move on? Because we are seeing. A bit of an evolution with the slot receiver where they're bigger guys now. It's not all just quick, you know, shifty, small slot receivers. You have guys like, you know, Cooper Cup and obviously Juju and Paris Campbell come out of the draft this year as a big slot receiver. And so, you know, would this team use the lack of size that Hilton has against them and say, you know, we want to get somebody bigger? And, and that's kind of a segue to what I wanted to ask you, Dave. And in, in, in NFL.com mock draft today, uh, they have the, the Steelers taking Byron Murphy at 20. Now, we know that maybe Corn was less of a need after the Steven Nelson signing, but. Would you consider someone like Murphy and play him inside at nickel over Hilton? Is that a possibility? Uh, I suppose he's still a guy that I haven't. I I, I want to drill in, drill down deeper in. You're probably better equipped because I think you've done the break. I think yeah. you've done, still done, have have done more work on Murphy than I am. I think Murphy is a guy that still should be considered in play for the Steelers. Well, when is the Washington Pro Day? I don't know. I can look it up, though. Well, let me just ask you a big picture. Forget about Murphy or any particular name, but would you be open to the idea? Because we know left corner's locked up right now. We know right corner's locked up for at least 2019. What about the nickel spot? Are you open to the idea of a potential upgrade if you get a name there in the first two rounds? Absolutely. And April okay. for, it looks like April Fool's Day is uh, the Washington Pro Day uh, date. And what day is... They don't go out there because they don't go out west. They, they, norm, they normally don't. 
you know. Uh, yeah, you know, we were looking at maybe, what, was it last year we were hoping they would get out to Stanford or wondering if they would get out to Stanford, and they didn't. But they have been to Stanford before. But they Look, yeah. if, they, if they like the kid and they, they're going to consider him a first-round pick, they're going to go see him. Sure, and there's nothing April 1st, according to the schedule you have, is just Indiana State and Washington. So <laughs> they're not going to Indiana State. So there's a place to go. It's 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 the Huskies. And April 1st is a Monday too, so it's not like they're going to be up against anything. You know, you go out there on a Sunday. So uh, I would, you know, I would expect them to be there this year. I think when you look at the rest of the slate, there's nothing on the yeah. ca- calendar that says that they won't. You know, you get back from that, and then you start conducting your uh, your 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 pre-draft visits and all. So I I think that'll be right. a, key, a key date. But uh, I mean, you you answer the question you just asked me. Uh, yeah, I'd be open to it, uh, and I like Murphy, and I said as much on Twitter the other day. And again, I like Hilton. I've been a big Hilton fan. I want to make that very clear. But am I open to the idea of it? Yeah, I mean, Murphy's a bigger guy. I think he would fit in the slot really well. I think he, he can play on the outside, but I think people that look at oh, he's a little small. Oh, he didn't run a great forty time. He ran a four five five. Let's let's kick him inside. Um, I think that's that's cool. So, and I I think that I, again, I like Hilton. He's got a chip on his shoulder. When I tweeted that out about, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of Murphy playing inside. Hilton saw the tweet, liked the tweet, and. <laughs> So I think he's not a fan of me right now, uh, but I'm always open to, to potential upgrades. And again, you know, is Hilton part of that long term plan? In my world, he probably would be. But in the Steelers mind, given the way that they used him or their lack of use of him at the end of last year, it opens the question in my mind, at least. All right. Run us down the rest of the, 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 the pro day action. Do you have the tracker up there? Sure. Uh, uh, what, what date should I start from? Because there's there's a no, whole lot going on here. Well, just most recent stuff of where, where the Steelers have been and, and what you think that means. Okay, I'll work backwards. Uh, the 21st, uh, that'd be Thursday. Again, the WVU a report was at least six guys. We know Colbert, Tomlin, Osofsky were at least three of them. You mentioned Matt Sims as well. They were at Missouri. Uh, Phil Kreidler was there. Emmanuel Hall, the receiver. Kendall Blanton, the tight end of the two names there. They had somebody at South Carolina. Couldn't quite figure out who. I think it's either Mike Butler or Dan Rooney Jr. Uh, they had somebody at Tulane. And Dan Colbert went to Michigan because he goes to all the Michigan ones. On the 20th, a uh, lot going on on the 20th on Wednesday. Again, Ohio State, a couple guys there. Mark Gorsick was at Northwestern State. They got a receiver, Jazz Ferguson, LSU transfer. It's a big height, weight, speed guy to look at. We mentioned Notre Dame sending a ton of guys there for all their prospects. We know Keith Butler, Rick Rapriche, and maybe Randy Feetner. Was, couldn't get a, the clearest picture of him, but I'm pretty sure it's Randy Feetner at Georgia. Um, DeAndre Baker, the receivers there, Godwin. Hardman, uh, uh, was Riley Ridley, uh, Elijah Holyfield. They had one guy at Boston College, uh, Duquesne, Pitt. They sent the scouting intern and Chazier for that. Uh, they were at USC. Uh, excuse me, USC. I'm on Marshall, the big name I want to look at there. They were at Wake Forest with area scout Mike Butler, and they were also at Western Kentucky for a couple low-level prospects. All right, and today is the LSU Pro Day. And you'd expect some big names to be there. Yeah, and I don't think we have anything on. Have you seen anything this morning on Kevin Colbert or Tomlin uh, uh, being being there at LSU yet? I haven't, but I really haven't looked, to be honest. So All right, so uh, pay pay attention to uh, our Twitter feeds and 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 SteelersDepot.com because obviously, you know, with Greedy and and uh, Devin White and geez, I mean uh, uh, Foster. Uh, Foster Moreau, geez, who else do they have there at, at, at LSU? A, a few other players worth mm-hmm. uh, checking in on as well, too. We would be a bit surprised if they're not spotted at, at LSU today. Uh, and one tweet, I want to try to verify this. Give me one second. According to Glenn West covering LSU sports for Tiger details, Mike Tomlin is at LSU's Pro Day. So, okay. And, no surprise there. Uh, that's not a, a big surprise It'd be interesting to see if if uh, Colbert's there. Look, they uh, they usually are there. <laughs> right. Yeah. So at least one of them there. So again, if you're talking about potential first round picks with someone like Greedy Williams, you know that's on the board with Tomlin there, and we'll see if Colbert. I imagine Colbert is there too because he was. Where was he at yesterday? Yesterday, West Virginia. Yeah, he, they probably took, took the trip together. I, uh, I I just retweeted uh, something from LSU's football main account. Uh, shows uh, Mike Tomlin. Sitting on a bench along with, uh, maybe you can look and tell me who that is sitting next to Mike Tomlin on that picture I just retweeted. Mm, it's looking like Dan Rooney Jr., I believe. Player personnel director Dan Rooney Jr. All right, you got that good of eyes? 
I, I, you should see some of this stuff when I go because when I when I do this pro day tracker, like I'm just going through videos on Twitter and Facebook and and and, and, and photo galleries, and it's like Zapruder film. I am like frame <laughs> by frame pausing stuff. I got to show you the one picture I found of Mike Butler at Clemson. It's just like a blur in the background, and I picked them out. So I guess I got that's that's my talent. <laughs> some people can play the piano. Some people play football. I'm good at finding Steelers scouting directors and and blurred out photos. You sure are. So we'll uh, we'll be getting a report up on this pretty soon uh, on studiodepot.com. All right, what else do we have? Uh, let's see. What do I have on my list here? Uh, two other things to cover before we get to reader emails. Uh, we'll go through these two topics pretty quickly because they honestly don't deserve that much time. But Le'Veon Bell, uh, I think he's just being very opportunistic with his interviews, and I'll keep it very short because I don't have any interest in talking about uh, Bell or Brown anymore, but just uh, playing the blame Ben game, saying that Ben Roethlisberger, one of the reasons why he wanted out of Pittsburgh, and I don't believe that for a second. I don't either, and I don't. Uh, I, I thought it was funny. He says the Steelers would have won the Super Bowl last year had Le'Veon Bell been there. Unless Le'Veon Bell can kick and <laughs> and, and, and play a little bit of defense, uh, yeah. I mean, it uh, it all sounds good. I, I'm with you. I just think this is uh, you know he saw. He saw all the uh, all the hype that Antonio Brown got from that sit down uh, that he had with ESPN. Uh, I I don't view Le'Veon Bell being too comfortable of a person in his own skin. I got to be honest with you. Uh, I I view him always as a me uh, kind of as a me too guy, and you know the, the the sit down that he did with SI ended up being what 25 minutes and all. It did. It seemed like he seemed like he doesn't have the best memory. Uh, either when it comes to some of this stuff, and obviously we've seen the numbers associated with the deal. Look, he look, he doesn't have to justify his decision to anybody but himself. If mm-hmm. we we're the ones that can sit back there and judge it and and compare it and say whether or not he made the right decision, because that's what that's what our job is to do. To to me, the more that he sits back here and tries to justify it, the more he looks kind of like an idiot if you ask me he's he may he's he's gonna put 20 something million in his pocket over the next couple of years plain mm-hmm. and simple all right uh a lot of people most people aren't even gonna make uh one twenty second of that in 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 their lifetime there so he so he's done that all right why do you have to now what what's the reasoning after the deal is done now of having to go and have this sit-down interview for 20-something minutes to bash your old team and then try to justify, you know, why you took the deal that you did. I, I, To me, it makes no sense. To me, you're only hurting yourself by doing something like this. And then he goes on to say that Pittsburgh uh, didn't treat him hu- uh, human like – I forget the, uh, the uh, correct quote did, there. Did, yeah, didn't treat him like a human. I mean – Come on. I mean, this is a guy that's got uh, social media stuff up saying how he would never leave Pittsburgh, uh, how Mike Tomlin, he can't imagine himself playing for any coach other than than uh, than Mike Tomlin, blah, blah, blah. All right. Look, life life comes at you quick. All right. Mm-hmm. If this is about the money, it's a, then say it's about the money. Don't say it's a, once you say it's not about the money. And I'm I I immediately think well it's about the money <laughs> <laughs> you know that, yeah. that 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 kind of thing there so you know, it's it's been discussed ad nauseum again much like the Antonio Brown stuff great if he thinks the city of Pittsburgh and the fans in Pittsburgh didn't treat or the media didn't treat him right in Pittsburgh oh boy he's in for a big surprise yeah. as far as New York comes because they are going to rip him to shreds he better hope he gets to off to a great start uh three and oh start with the uh with the jets here because if he doesn't if he stumbles out of out of shooting and if he misses any ota or training camp time with any kind of injury or his running style results in 3.8 yards per carry right out of shooting the jets are zero and three they are going to rip him to shreds 
Oh yeah, yeah. Bell taking the I'm, "I've been persecuted" angle is is an interesting one to say the least. And yeah, it's just about the money, and that's totally fine. You know, I get that people said Bell was greedy, and yeah, he was, but he has every right to be greedy. If he didn't want to play on the tag, he didn't want to play this year. Well within his right, and that's what he wants to do. Cool with me. I think the way he went about it, and the idea that he was going to show up, will he, won't he, was the wrong direction but if you didn't want to play fine by me but don't act like you didn't want to play for pittsburgh because of ben you you almost signed a contract twice you were didn't you know way steep in contract talks for for two straight years you, you talked about how close you were to returning to pittsburgh after week one or week 10 or whatever week it was oh so and, then, and then him saying the new information my god i would have fired a decent bakari yeah, uh, I mean, I you, about. I can't. Can you believe that him new information came about that I didn't have to play to get in a crude season? You got to be kidding me! <laughs> it's one on one. You got yeah. to be kidding me! I I deserve to be an agent if uh, <laughs> if if that's true. I really should be yeah. an agent if that's true. Yeah, again, it just and and to blame Ben. I mean, him blaming Ben is just is just reading the moment, and everyone's against Ben in the national media, and and everyone's kind of just accepting that and everyone's you know playing the blame Ben game so Bell jumps in to try to get in some brownie points to make him seem like the good guy because he thinks that you know that that's the best way to, to frame it right now and make him look a little bit better but it, it was about the money and that's fine that he didn't want what Pittsburgh offered cool with me understand do what you want to do but don't don't blame Ben and, and he, he tries to say that when he talked about not being treated like a human he was talking about the city I don't, I don't believe that's true but also if you read the quote and I, I know that you did He's talking about the organization when he, he made that comment. So he's saying the organization didn't treat him like a human and didn't let him do things that were fun. And I point you in the direction of Juju because that's all he does outside of football is have fun about treating you human and letting you do things that, that you know, be expressive and be your own man. Look, are the Steelers perfect? No. Good, of course not. Uh, is Ben Roethlisberger perfect? God, no. Yep. Does, does Ben Roethlisberger probably do some things that you know up, upset players probably I, I you know i don't know i'm not there uh but th- there's more to it than just that it's about the money just say that i yeah. don't like the way the steelers do business uh my agent adisa bakari laid it all out with the steelers and how they like how they don't like to do the guaranteed money i just didn't like the offer and i decided to to sit out to save my uh to you know because if i would have got injured blah 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 and that's where i am at now and that's why i i took the deal that i took with the jets because a little bit at least i'm guaranteed 20 something million uh uh, uh, versus what you know, if I would have played under attack for 14 point million, we'll find out if I made made the right uh, uh, right decision there. But that's you know, as Forrest Gump would say, that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, said well. He just uh, Bell's just capitalizing on the moment and the Ben hate. All right, Dave. Enough about that. The other topic, and I want to talk about this even less than I want to talk about Bell, but we saw it because. We got another lesson in how the internet works and how quickly stories can come up and how you know just. Not to toot our own horn here, but I think this is how well of a job that we do, and and how we try to keep things pers- in perspective, and you know work really hard at at focusing on the Steelers. And when you see the national media try to talk about teams that they don't cover the way that we cover them, you get some big mistakes. And so there was one article in Bleacher Report talking about Joe Hayden being a potential. Actually, the Steelers, I'm quoting it almost verbatim here, have no choice but to cut Joe Hayden, and nothing could be further from the truth. Right. I was hoping you were going to hit the Justin Houston thing oh, as well. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> even worse somehow of a report, air quotes. Yeah, they were no they, – they, I bet they didn't even lob off a call to uh, Justin Houston and his agent. For people to believe – to have halfway – you know what it is, is you have that hope and the want that sure. you believe yep. almost anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, Wake, you know, wake up, people. All right, as far as the Bleacher Report article goes, uh, you know, the, for a site that's wanting, you know, uh, more credibility over the years, they certainly took a step backwards here. For him to even, A, it's comical enough that he that he included Joe Hayden as a player that the Steelers almost certainly have to cut uh, this year. His reasoning behind it was absolutely uh, face-palming. I mean, and, and I wouldn't, you know, if I wouldn't have gotten emailed and tweeted this article so much, I wouldn't even touched it. But you know, he says heading into the weekend, the Steelers only had about eight million in cap space, but that number shrank uh, with the signing of linebacker Mark Barron. He goes on to write, Barron signed a two-year, twelve million dollar deal. That's probably the only factual thing he had <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in, in the entire post uh, that will likely put his 2012 cap number somewhere between five and six million. Wrong. 
Uh, but, uh, however, Pittsburgh's 10-pick draft class will cost approximately $8 million. That's another thing he was he was relatively close on, depending on how many of those they, those picks it keeps. The Steelers don't have the money to sign their draft class without making a serious roster cut. Boy, somebody, I hope he, I hope this kid Derek Clawson read my uh, read my post because somebody needed to take him back behind the barn and and teach him a little bit about roster displacement. Uh, with, <laughs> Is that where, what they do behind the barn? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, either that or they shoot old yeller. I'm not 100 percent right. sure, but uh, like uh, well, there's there's one other thing that you can do behind the barn. Let's uh, all right. <laughs> but, moving forward, moving but, forward here. But besides painting it red. <laughs> Moving forward here as quickly as possible. Listen, roster displacement. If you want a simple exercise as far as draft class and being able to afford a draft class versus roster displacement, you don't need to take your shoes off. You don't need an Excel spreadsheet. Just take what the speculated rookie pool amount supposed to be. And every year at this time, you can find that on overthecap.com, a great close assumption of what the what the current uh, rookie cap pool is going to be which by the way is a little bit over eight point million uh, 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 so far you take that eight point one seven seven million a little bit over that to be exact you take that number you take the number of draft picks that the skid that the Steelers are currently scheduled to have which is 10 and you multiply that 10 by the Minimum salary a rookie can make in 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 2019, and that number is for uh, 495 thousand dollars. So if you take 10 times it by a minimum salary a kid can earn, you get 4.95 million dollars. You take that 4.95 million dollars and you subtract it from the estimated rookie pool amount, which is $8.177 million, or a little over that, and you quickly get a derivative of, let's say, $3.2278 million. Let's just round up and call it $3.3 million on the high side. That is the maximum amount that you're probably going to need to afford after roster displacement your draft class now we that's a rough and dirty estimate obviously we're dealing with a minimum salary amount now if you were to do the full pull out your your excel spreadsheet and and your your uh, uh junior salary cap uh hat and and do all the correct math on this the Steelers currently need an estimated 2.7 million dollars in cap space to sign their entire 10 pick draft class so that just shows you how how 8 million a little over 8 million is a lot different than 2.7 million it's because roster displacement when a player goes on to the rule of 51 you got to take another one that's on it off and displace the difference and that's why this Derek, it was so incredibly way off, and that's why you should be reading SteelersDepot.com instead of Bleacher Report when it comes to getting your Steeler stuff. Yep, and that's all I think you got to say about that. So Joe Hayden will be a Steeler in 2019, and, and, and the problem with that is the, that— The only th- cutting going on with Joe Hayden this offseason might be the Steelers cutting him a contract extension somewhere during training camp. Right. Yeah, it's funny when you talk about a guy getting cut when he's much more likely to get a contract extension. Uh, but it, and, and maybe this was my fault for even tweeting about it. Maybe I kind of pulled the whole Streisand effect here. But now, like I see on Facebook and on Twitter and I saw some other beat guys get asked, is Joe Hayden getting cut? Is he getting cut? So I don't know how these stories get to that level, but that's just kind of how it goes sometimes with, with confusion and, 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 and these stories, places like Bleach Report, that come up and, and make things sound a lot worse than they are. Absolutely. All right, Dave, let's close out the show with a couple of reader emails. All right, do we have everything else that we wanted to cover in there? I think so, right? I think so, yeah. I'll look at my list here. Uh, My handwriting is not too good, but yeah, I think that's everything. All right, let's go to the the terrible podcast email machine from Derek Wilson in Somerset, Kentucky. If we were able to draft Devin Bush, could you see the Steelers playing both Bush and Barron and moving Vince Williams to the outside linebacker rotation some? Uh, I'll let you take that, Alex. Well, Vince isn't moving outside. I mean, he's done a little bit of edge work, but he's certainly not an edge guy. Uh, he's, that's he's rushed off the edge, and he's damn good yeah. at, at, at rushing off the edge. Uh, 
a, in in kind of numbers situation, not as a true kind of edge. And boy, he can sure give them running backs hell back there. But I mean, he's not an outside line. Outside yeah, I'd linebacker. rather I'd rather him rush from the A or B gap. Really, the B gap is where he does his best work. Um, it's an inter- interesting question though. What happens with Vince Williams if you do get a Devin Bush and and, and Mark Barron? How do you make that work? And I don't have a great answer to that right now. I mean, I'd like to have Vince on the field. Um, again, I think Barron's that Mac linebacker. I'm worried about if you have Bush and Barron on the field, two guys that do have some question marks about their run defense and, uh, and and getting off of blocks and playing physical and strong at the point of attack. So I don't know if you want two of that same guy you know, on first and 10 against, you know, two tight end sets, but yeah, I, we'll, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. I, I, I'm obviously a big Vince fan, Williams, Williams fan, though. I don't think we're going to have to worry about that, at least in the first half of the regular season with, with, well, with Vince coming off much. You, well, I mean, if you do draft Devin Bush, you want to play him as soon as possible. Though I'm not, I'm not I mean, maybe you sit him if he's not ready, but if he's ready, you play him as soon as you can. Right. I still don't think you're going to see that first half of the season. All right. Well, again, we'll, we'll cross that bridge here when we come to it. All right. Uh, let's see. From Daniel, let's see. Daniel Sarich. He didn't put the phonetic. He put the phonetic spelling of Dan in here. <laughs> Dan in Texas. Uh, any chance Ben would be waiting to sign his extension until after the draft to leverage which position, which positions the Steelers prioritize in the draft? Pretend that this is true. What position or player type would Ben be pounding the table for? I see where Daniel's going here. He's saying, uh, is is Ben Power playing the Steelers and is saying, I'm not going to sign an extension unless you get me X at the top of the draft. And, all right, we'll play along with the game. <laughs> I don't think that's happening, but we'll play along, Daniel. A 6'4 wide receiver named... <laughs> Miles, yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, uh, that 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 that's the game. Yeah, I'd obviously be in that scenario. Ben wanting an offensive weapon, a big big receiver replacement for AB. So yeah, Hakeem Butler, Miles Boykin, those type of guys. But again, or, I don't believe that's or, or tight end. end. They want you know, the or Iowa tight, end. T- tight yeah. end or something like along those lines. It would it would, be, uh, it would probably be along those lines. I would think. Uh, Daniel, uh, Steve DeLuca writes in man versus man versus zone. Do you guys see, uh, see more zone D coming this year? Keep Lamar and Baker from scrambling and get more turnovers. Nelson played a lot of man in KC, but he can also come up and tackle a problem for old corners, not named, uh, Mike Hilton. I, look, I don't. You don't you don't want to see him. You know, why go out and get a guy that primarily played man coverage? Even though, look, you go back and look at his uh, college tape. Obviously, Stephen Nelson could play some uh, some 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 zone and all like that. But I would not expect them move to more zone this year. No, I wouldn't either. They ran the third most man coverage last year. They're paying Nelson eight million. They're paying Hayden what nine million. Um, you, you know, you could put another high profile pick. You got first round picks and in, in, in some of these secondary guys like you know Edmonds. You're, you're playing as much man coverage as possible. Now, I understand it's a really good point about playing Baker, playing Jackson, zone coverage. You want to have eyes on the quarterback, but I think the way that you deal with that is you play man coverage in the back end, but you really emphasize and work on you know rush lane integrity and in, and in, in, in not letting the quarterback escape the pocket. Um, as a pass rush unit working as a team rather than playing zone coverage because zone just doesn't work. I mean, you're just going to get picked apart. I love, I love all these phonetic spellings that people send in now. <laughs> their, <laughs> other names. Good job. Uh, we got one here from KC Tangelo. How's that? Uh, <laughs> uh, did I pass Casey? Dave, I know one of your favorite words is fungible. Well, it's, 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 it's one of the few big words that I know, Casey. Uh, in hindsight, after everything that's transpired since Bell not signing long-term with the Steelers, would you guys go back and offer it again, yes or no? In other words, was Bell turning that deal down a success for, or failure for the, for the team? Uh, look, you know, based on the numbers that we know or that we think that we know that were out there uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the the deal that that Le'Veon Bell was offered, I have no I know I have no problem had he accepted that deal because he would be very much cuttable. I'd, I'd much rather have Bell than not have him uh, because of everything because we we've seen what all he can give you on on offense. So ha, you know. Is is it is it a godsend from a a a cash flow and salary cap standpoint? 
Maybe. I mean, we saw what uh, what James Conner and Jalen Samuels were able to do combined last year. I will continue to say this about, about Le'Veon Bell and one area where he still probably doesn't get enough uh, uh, respect in, and he pro- I, I haven't read what the bloggers of the Jets and the media and uh, the New York media have written about, about Le'Veon Bell, but his pass blocking, uh, he's probably one of, if not the best pass blocking running back in the league. So I don't think that gets enough play, and, and that has some level of value uh, when it comes to that contract he's offered. So are we going to look back at this and say it was a great, it was great that he didn't accept the deal? It's possible, but if I would go back and do it again, especially at the numbers that we think we know about the Le'Veon Bell deal, I would have had no problem with him signing it. Alex? Yeah, I'm pretty much with you on that one. And what do you think about his pass blocking? Oh yeah, the best I'd say best in football. All right. Especially uh, for the starting running backs, there might be a niche guy and then I'm missing a third down guy. But in terms of the every down guys, he's he's number one. All right, Jonathan Mason writes in, Alex and Dave, I have if both Devons are gone before the Steelers could even trade up a few spots, I'm having a hard time seeing anything other than wide receiver making sp- making sense. Mac Wilson is a reach at 20. I would agree with Mac Wilson being a reach at 20 right now. I don't see uh, I don't see a cornerback with Steven Nelson making 8.5 million this year and I don't see an edge with Bud making uh, making 9 million this year. What do you guys think? Look, I you don't not you you do not 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 draft a cornerback or, or a top edge if you have one that you like just because of you signing those guys, or, or, or especially Steven Nelson. Uh, you obviously think Steven Nelson is going to be a starter this year. As far as the edge goes, what are you going to do after assuming Bud does not get a deal, which he shouldn't, <laughs> uh, between now and the start of training camp? What are you going to do in 2020 with your edge situation? Now, the question becomes, is there an edge worthy of, of drafting at 20 overall? Uh, that's, that's a good question, and we still got to figure out there. Uh, but I do agree that wide receiver makes sense. I think tight end comes into play there. Uh, as well, and I think to some degree you still have to consider maybe a cornerback like the uh, the kid out of Washington, out of Washington, Alex. I'm still trying to wrap my head around. What'd you say? You don't not, have not, to not. not not yeah quadruple negative there. I don't know what you're trying to say. <laughs> no, I get it. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to peg myself in one role. Uh, you could look at a corner as you said, talk about that, that nickel spot, edge guy. Edge guy's still gonna play. Number three is gonna play. You know, minimum 300-ish snaps this year, rotating on both sides. Injury happens to either your outside guys, which is possible, more than likely, to at some point, for some extent, you know, they're going to play. And the next year, you're looking at, you know, replacement for Bud Dupree. So edge is still possible. Now, finding a name at edge is just tougher than, than the idea of it. But also, don't forget about that dime guy, too. You know, talking about Gardner Johnson and Rapp and all them, um, that dime position, I think, is still pretty open and needs to be filled. So a lot of options. I don't think you have to say just receiver, though I agree receiver certainly has to be considered. We're very popular in Belgium, it, it appears here. Uh, hey. uh, Cohen from Belgium writes in, apologies if this has been asked before and, and is or a stupid question. Uh, what does the future hold for Mason Rudolph? Was he drafted as a career backup, a legitimate heir to the throne, or is there a possibility he is traded now that Ben is no longer talking retirement in the near future? Love the podcast. Keep all the good work all around, guys. We have talked quite a bit about Mason Rudolph. A... None of us really know what Mason Rudolph is or isn't at this point. We are still mm-hmm. going off of his college film and his little limited uh, preseason play last year, which overly was not fantastic. And Alex saying that he made some progress, he thought, uh, during training camp last year. The, I, you know, I... Was he drafted to be a career backup or a legitimate heir? I think that's still yet to be, re- be determined right now. I think they viewed... I think it's exactly what Kevin Colbert has said about Mason Rudolph to this point. They viewed him as a first-round talent that they figured was worth trading up a couple of spots to get in the third last year, and that's where they are right now. Alex and I have talked quite a bit that we will be very, very disappointed if Mason Rudolph does not win the backup quarterback job this year during training camp in the preseason. Hugely disappointed uh, if he does not win that job. And then you go from there. I do not believe that you spend a third round draft pick on a quarterback 
to turn around and trade him away unless you can get a first round draft pick or unless you're totally soured on the kid uh, right away. So I don't think trading is an option when it comes to Mason Rudolph unless you indeed thought you could get a first round pick uh, for him and you were totally soured on what you've seen on him so far. Yeah, he was drafted to be the heir, and that's what I believe the team's plan. It's just a question of will he get that opportunity, and that's all depending on what Ben does in his future. But but he was drafted to be the heir. He was, Dobbs was drafted to be a backup, not Rudolph. Rudolph was drafted to be the guy. Shannon Gonzalez writes in, hey, fellas, big fan, how did Chase Winovich's uh, measurables combine numbers match up with T.J. Watt? Are they similar players? I went and looked at the uh, – I was looking – I wanted to uh, look at the mock draftable, the spider. So we had a uh, uh, listener write in about the spider webs as, uh, and, and all like that. So I went and pulled both of the spider webs from mockdraftable.com on both T.J. Watt and Chase Winovich. And I, I measured them both as using the edge feature that you can – they're not close. <laughs> the vert, I'm sure, is a huge difference. Three film was similar, but vert was a huge difference. Yeah, there. Uh, even when you look at uh, uh, arm length and you know uh, uh, body measurements, they're not close. Now, mm-hmm. you thankfully we don't judge players just on spider webs. Uh, that's a great, great song, by the way. You, are you no doubt fan? No. No. Never, oh, never what, listened what, to. What, what, a what, what, what year are they? Nineteen uh, twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Hush. I, I think uh, what what a spider web's great no doubt song go back and pull that up on on the youtube machine today what a great song that is got me thinking about that down the rabbit hole i went back up i come uh <laughs> one man show featuring dave <laughs> ryan i could i could and it's yeah. gonna happen one day after oh, i retire I from from the depot i'm gonna have the one the one man podcast where i have some guests on and all like that but uh, regardless out of the rabbit hole i come uh you look at his tape and, and, and I've, I've done a contextualization on him as well, too. As a pass rusher and a run defender, there's some good stuff he's done on tape. Uh, good hand usage, good, good uh, pass rush counters, uh, uh, some push-pull uh, in there, some rip in there. Uh, there's some reasons to believe and to understand why they were at Michigan to look at him or to, uh, mm-hmm. and, and Bush and have dinner with him uh, and all. But let's not, let's not even – closely think that this is a kid that's getting first round consideration from the Steelers and probably not second round consideration. However, third round, fourth round, fifth round, absolutely in play, even though he did not play on his feet quite a bit or much of any. I think that's one of the big things when it comes to Winovich is, is not an elite athlete, did not play on his feet a lot on Michigan. Everything else, I mean, as far as the results go, if you want to look at results-based, it's there. It's on the tape. There's not a lot not to like about him when it comes to result-based and the attitude and the, the character of this kid. But as far as measuring up to T.J. Watt from a measurable standpoint, not there. Yeah, I agree. Now, I will put Winovich possibly in play at 52. And I think going from, you know, 66 or if he goes even later than that, certainly in play. But second round, yeah, I'm not going to rule it out. That's why I said probably not. Yeah, well, I'll, okay, I'll be, I, I think it's possible. I think it's 50-50 for 52. I, don't, I wouldn't say probably not. That. I disagree I, slightly. Right? I still think it's a little high for him there. But third, 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 third and on, game on. You know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, he is a guy I think can help you on special team. He's a little bit older, I think, too. Although we talked about not knowing what the birthdays are for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. But but there there is some. Go look at my contextualization post on him and run through those whatever 30, 40 plays uh, that I have. There there's a lot to like about him as a run defender and as a as a pass rusher. There. Uh, from Michael Evans writes in. Have you explored the possibility of of, of uh, Cleveland Farrell falling to the Steelers at twenty? I know we have Bud, but he is roughly the same size as TJ. Could could be his bookend for years to come. Your thoughts, uh, Alex? I'll let you take this one. Um, again, I, I don't know if he's the most natural guy for for that edge spot. Um, and I, I a little bit bigger, I think. Oh, what's he weighing in at? I'm trying to find his. Two, uh, what? Two seventy something? Or? Yeah, I thought he was heavier. I mean, I know Bud came in heavy. Um, and and I know that the schemes have blurred and. The, Backers are dropping less, they're dropping 20% of the time now, and so that makes it more palatable. But 
I, I'd still probably lean no on that. I'm not going to say absolutely not, but but I'm leaning pretty heavily. Uh, six foot four, three eighths, two sixty four at the combine. Had uh, had some uh, nice back scratchers at thirty four and one eighth inch. Some nice lobster crackers at ten and a half inch. There, I think I saw something though at his uh, pro day, maybe a little bit heavier, like two seventy two or something. I might yeah. maybe, maybe I'm wrong there. He did. I, I don't. Uh, his uh he didn't run the 40 right at his uh at the uh, at the combine but he but he did do 25 on the bench a 4 4 20 uh uh just this just got me thinking of something to going through this real quick here uh his 20 yard shot a boy i can go down a rabbit hole in a heartbeat can i uh, mm-hmm. He 4.4 20 yard shuttle, uh, 12.13 60 yard shuttle. Probably shouldn't have ran that. You have a three uh, cone time? Three cone, uh, 7.26. Not bad at all. Not, yeah, not awful, I mean, but but not turn the corner. Not 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 uh, stop on dime. Give you nine cents change turning the corner. Yeah, I mean he's a bigger guy, so I wouldn't expect like a you know a six eight, but seven two six. We're getting into that very Dupree territory. I don't know if they want to relive that experience. Holy moly, what did you think about Jalen Ferguson? <laughs> yeah, what was that? Now, did you see some of the context that got released about that time a little bit later? That was apparently his like I think seventh attempt at the three cone, and that's not a good thing. Apparently, he slipped like every time before, and so the time he completed it, I mean, he, he was totally gassed. But obviously, the fact that he slipped, I think, f- the five times before is a big flexibility issue because that's all about you know testing your flexibility and balance. But but that he did record that I think on his sixth attempt for his three cone. I thought it was a six cone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's just an awful workout, top to bottom. And I don't think the Steelers had anyone at it, at, at uh, Louisiana Tech's pro day. So not that he's on the radar after that workout, but even heading into it, did not appear to be on the team's radar. Boy, I almost swallowed my gum, and I wasn't chewing any. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. From Dominic Lamarca writes in Nick Nick Lamarca, uh, Dave and Alex, with the increased cap and the way teams are spending money, what do you believe budget pre value would have been on the open market? Would he honestly have gotten less than nine million? The Steelers are paying him. Well, uh, you look at what Chick got, and even if you boil that down to you know, what do we say is 2019 take for Chick was to kind of justify that a little bit better uh, with, with Chickalo. I, you know, maybe Bud Dupree gets six million, seven million on the open market. Yeah, he wouldn't have gotten a 9.2s making make this year, and the contract structure I'm sure would have been really interesting to look at. He probably would have gotten, yeah, I would say he would get probably maybe seven million per year, but again, the contract structure can can change the reality of that money pretty quickly. Here's the thing: had he signed a long term deal? Uh, but maybe he at least pocketed nine million, you know, when yeah. in signing bonus in first year, uh, first year base salary. Had he signed a long term deal and not gotten, gotten that option, maybe he makes nine million and puts right. it in his pocket. Maybe that maybe his yearly average is something around seven or something like that. So thanks. And, for, it, go ahead. And remember, my issue with Bud isn't just that they're paying him nine point two million, but it is an issue. But it's also this is for one year. If this was a long term deal, maybe it's a little different conversation. But the fact that it's nine point two million and he's a free agent after this year, and you have to pay him that much or more in twenty twenty, then that's even a bigger problem. All right, from Cameron Andrews writes in, what's up, guys? Cameron Andrews again with the signing of Mark B. I guess that's Baron. Is best player available a way to go in the draft that the Devons are taken and the three corners, Williams, Baker, and Byron are, 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 are gone? Could you see them trading down in the draft? Besides Ben, who else do you see them extending before the season starts? Who's your breakout player this year? I see Sean Davis having a good year with it being his second year at the position. Bud will not surprise me. If he has a good year contract year and just needs to uh, needs to not outrun and finish to play, Hargrave is only getting better every year with every snap. My wild card is Eli Rogers, though. Look for him three games and went healthy, given an opportunity, play played good for us there. Boy, you uh really point for the fence there, uh, Cameron, and, and you got a lot of questions in in a short yeah. paragraph there. Uh, let's see, best player available. Look, we talk. We talk time and time again how Kevin Colbert approaches the off season to put himself in a position where he doesn't have to re, or, you know, ha, doesn't have to uh, uh, zero in on one player. I really think he's got himself in that position again. However, I think you have to give some credence to need a little bit. You know, there's a whole need want 
blah, blah, blah. Uh, your need has got to be a little bit bigger than your want. Uh, once again, in this, this draft, if both the Devons are taken and let's uh, – I I don't imagine they're on, they're as high as greedy and and uh, look greedy uh, probably probably I don't want to fall down the trap of he's not going to be there even if greedy's on the board I don't know if you can find a team willing to come up and get greedy at that point I think I might go down a couple of spots there I don't think Baker is in their sights and we'll see what happens with Byron Murphy and this pro day coming up but yeah I if both the Devons are gone and those three players are off the board. I think you got to look at it and say, who is your best player? Yeah, for me, it's always been, you know, I know Colbert always says it's just BPA, but it's a little more than that. Obviously, it's BPA where it intersects need and where you get the, the maximum talent at a position of need. Um, so, yeah, a lot of ways you can go there. The, the other questions about breakout player, I'd have to think about that more. Um, you know, if core, if a core four hits that, that right tackle spot, beats out Filer, I think he can play really well. You know, I, I like how Edmonds ended the season. I don't know if I consider him a breakout player, but I think he can kind of carry over, you know, how he finished the year. Um, but that, that's a good question. And Eli's an interesting, you know, interesting name to throw out there. All right. Uh, one, he asked the two about who else we see them extending before the season starts uh, besides Ben. I think Hargrave is a perfect candidate. We kind of <laughs> we kind of toss the idea of Sean Davis, whether or whether or not we think that might happen. You know, we just talked a little bit about Joe Hayden, you know, the Joe Hayden that's supposed to get cut. Maybe he gets a contract extension once the team gets to training camp and and and, and on in, into uh, uh, closer, you know, in, into the preseason. Maybe he's a guy you look at extending we just mentioned mike hilton you know yep. they're, they're, they're probably probably a decent chance of him getting an extension uh who else uh those are probably the big names i don't think we're missing anyone i i i don't think davis gets it i wouldn't do it with davis i certainly would with hargrave though money would be interesting i'm curious how that negotiation would go though all right, so uh, do we hit all the all, all of it there? I think we did. Let's see. One other thing. The cost to trade up for a Devin in the first, no chance in capital letters, writes Taylor Carpenter. Dave and Alex, I, I heard you read my email on the Monday podcast regarding there being little to no chance that Devin middle linebacker would be available at, at pick 20. Uh, for for the student. By the way, if you're interested here, okay, I uh, I guess in so many words he's saying that because if you use the trade value uh, chart, that it would be too expensive for the Steelers to move up. Uh, look, if the Steelers move up any in the first round for for a Devin in this draft, it's not going to be but by a spot or two. I don't think. Uh, you have to go back to <sighs> when's the last time they 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 traded up uh, Holmes in in the first uh, in the first round. San Antonio Holmes and oh, Troy. Yeah. I think Troy, I Troy, uh, Troy, maybe you really have to be a fan of going up here uh, because it, yeah, it will be expensive. So for people are saying that that the Steelers have to go up to get one of those bushes if they or one of those Devons if they want it. That that might end up being true here, but boy, you better really love Devin Bush if you're going to go up more than a spot or two, because yeah, it's probably going to cost uh, uh, a lot, and I'm not sure that they love Devin Bush that much. I they they seem to at this pro day. Now I don't know what's in their head right now, but there's strong interest there, and I think you could try to go up five, and I think if you go up five, it'll cost you that 66 pick. And I think it's possible. Are you willing to give up that second round pick for, for Devin Bush? Uh, second round, probably not. Well, maybe. But yeah, I did not to go up five. I have to go up a lot higher than that to give that, that up. But if you go up five, which you may take more than five against, since he had 11, really scares me there. There's a potential fit for, for Devin Bush. But if you go up five, it'll cost you, I think, 66 and maybe something a little bit later, maybe something next year. All right, uh, one last one as, as the train goes by, Alex. Catch the train, Alex. Yeah. Uh, tra train jumping. John Calderelli writes, uh, uh, let's see, I really hope that one of the Devon middle linebackers are still there at pick 20. Folks, go watch. Do me a favor. Go watch the David Long out of uh, West Virginia. Uh, let's see, middle linebackers are still there at pick 20. But if not, I really love this pick. Consider a a 
a strong, massive, immovable force in the middle of the defensive line who can push the middle and get to the quarterback. Dexter Lawrence, defensive line, Clemson, love the man. At combine, six foot four, three hundred forty-two pounds, five foot. 5.05 second 40 time, 36 reps, 225. His tape is amazing. He can push the middle and get to the quarterback. Uh, he has a size, strength, anchor, nose, and play tackle with speed and strength. Get to the quarterback. Consider a new, young, immovable piece on the defensive line. Consider getting this this guy picked at pick 27 because the Raiders want to move up to pick 20 to get Marquise Brown to pair with Antonio. Certainly, a relationship exists between Raiders and the Steelers with Gruden, Mayock, Tomlin, and multiple recent trades. Acquiring Dexter Lawrence with or without draft capital would be great. Stop the run, pressure the quarterback, all starts with options along defensive line. Look, I admit that uh, that Lawrence is a, a fun to watch on tape. However, if you're drafting him that high in the first round, yeah, most teams are probably, and, and at, 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 at that weight, unless he can get that weight down, he's probably not going to be an every down player, or at least right out of the shoot, especially not for the Steelers. That seems like, and this goes back to, to the old Andrew uh, Billings with, with Alex and I a couple years ago. They're not going to, you know, you got Javon Hargrave in there already. You got to it and, and Hayward, and they're paying those guys big money to play at least 75% of the snaps. Uh, whatever whatever sub package you can get uh, Hargrave on the on the field for or or base is a plus on that. I just they would really have to be in love with Dexter Lawrence to uh, to get him at 20 or 27 or wherever. Yeah, I mean, you got to give me a path. How are you going to get at least 500 snaps out of this guy? Your first round picks have to play. They got to play right away. They got to play well. Um, and I don't know how you do that with a defensive line that you have. I'm open to D line. I said it could surprise. I think he could see a third, fourth round the way they went tackle last year. Not surprised. Trying to have some foresight and, and make that move a year before it becomes a true need. But first round and a nose tackle, too rich for me. I think the only other argument about that it would be Kevin Colbert saying you don't pass on good players, you know. But I, I just. Yeah. Uh, they got Big Dan. Oh, you can't you can't miss on Big Dan. That keeps going back. Oh Lord! But, but uh, I, 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 from where I sit right now, I can't see that being the path. Uh, one last one. Brian Ratica, Ratica. Brian, you should put your last name for that spelling in there. Cedar seven round mock 1.0. Brian Core 09. I don't know what that means, but uh, he goes uh, all right. Uh, looks like he has the ten picks in here, and I'll read off his mock draft. So everybody can mock him uh, real quick. He has Devin Bush, uh, Amani Arore out of Penn State in the second. Uh, Butler, the wide receiver out of Iowa, Iowa State in the third. Winovich in the third with the second of two third-round picks. Stenberger, I know nothing about. Tight end out of Texas A&M. Have you watched him yet? I haven't watched him, but he's good hands. Not much of a blocker. Ran okay at the combine. Was that Jay Sternberger from a &M? Yeah, kind of a receiver-type tight end. That's what he has in the fourth round. Fifth round, he has uh, uh, Bryce Love running back out of Stanford. Uh, round six, he has Ratliff Williams, the wide receiver out of North Carolina. I have not watched any tape on yeah. him. Uh, Cheevers, the cornerback out of Boston College, round six. I have not seen Cheevers on tape. Have you? Yeah, he's a nickel guy. They do it for the ball school. Seven picks last year, let college football. He's going to have to move to nickel, I think, even free safety. But the dude's like 170 pounds and pretty not not very physical. Uh, round six, the uh, the last uh, pick in round, the, 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 th the third of three uh, six-round picks, he has Egbulie, inside, outside linebacker out of Houston. Another guy I've yet to watch. In pick, pick 219, the seventh-round pick, he has Mustafer, the uh, the center out of Notre Dame, another guy I'm I'm behind on there. Brian, if you watch, if you truly watched tape on all these guys and just not picking them out of out of names and measurables, God bless you uh, uh, on that because there's several names on this list I have not dealt got gone into deep yet. Uh, there, if we were to put this mock draft up on TheSteelersDepot.com, it would probably be mocked. <laughs> as they all are. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to say, as they all are. All right, anything else? Uh, I think we've gone through the email machine pretty good. Thanks to everybody who have uh, uh, who have uh, sent in emails. Keep them coming. We'll read more when we get back on this on Tuesday. What else you got for me, Alex? Uh, I don't know. We'll have to check on the pro days with, uh, we know Tomlin's there. We know Rooney, Dan Rooney Jr.'s there. Probably Colbert's there. Uh, we'll follow that. And um, some of these more prospect profiles will come out for sure. And we'll wait for Burnett's release. 
Alex, I'll take, let's get to the end of the show for 500, please. Hey, uh, yes, sir. Uh, all right. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. You can follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazor. If you like the show, want to email us a question, uh, do so. And I, I'm interested to hear the people's feedback on David Long. That's, that's everybody's homework, uh, podcast homework. And yours too, Alex, for the, for the weekend. We're going to talk right. a little bit more about uh, David Long out of West Virginia on, 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 on the Tuesday show. The Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. Tell me what you like, what you don't like about long. Send us any questions that you have. Uh, if you like the show, if we amuse you like clowns or like good analysts, you can donate to the show. Go to SteelersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right navigational bar to send a donation via PayPal. If you want an ad-free version of the site, we just had a minor hiccup with this uh, yesterday that we got solved uh, on the site. Uh, uh, it wasn't a huge hiccup, but got that solved at all. Uh, got it even faster, I think, too. If you want an ad-free version of SteedersDepot.com for a one-year, one-time payment of $25, go to SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad-free button, upper right navigational bar. I don't think you'll be disappointed if you do that. You help our cause, and you get an ad-free version of SteedersDepot.com on top of it. And with that, have a great day weekend. As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.